In this video, we're going to talk about the definition of and how to calculate the average atomic weight of an atom. Let's start with a quick list of learning objectives. To begin with, we're going to need to distinguish between atomic mass and atomic weight. These are terms that are often inter used interchangeably, but in actuality, they have subtle differences. Uh, we need to make sure that we point out those subtle differences so you can distinguish between one and the other. That'll lead us right into a discussion of isotopes. We need to define what an isotope actually is, and you need to know how they apply back to the idea of atomic weight. When working with isotopes, we're going to need a lot of data. That data is going to come in the form of a stable isotopes data table. You need to learn where to get that data table and ultimately how to interpret it. Finally, we'll wrap this whole thing up by talking about how to calculate average atomic weight from the isotope data and the definitions we had earlier in the, uh, in the discussion. Before we get too far into this topic, let's take a minute to recall some of the information we've talked about in previous videos. Uh, prior to this, we've already defined the terms atomic mass and mass number, and so far we've been using these two terms interchangeably. If you recall, atomic mass is calculated using this equation here. It's going to be the number of protons plus the neutrons, and we have a unit for this. That is the AMU, or atomic mass unit, possibly one of the poorest unit names ever determined by science. One last thing we noted here is that this is not something you would find on the periodic table. This data you cannot get that way. You can only get it via our formula right here. Now in contrast, today we're talking about atomic weight. Now this is the data we find here on the periodic table. and We can take a quick example of the element boron over here on the right. It tells us, uh, if you use your key, it tells us this number up on top here is going to be our average atomic weight. And that's the information we'll be working with today. And again, distinguishing between the fact that it is not atomic mass. So let's start talking about the distinction between these two terms, atomic mass and atomic weight. Uh, as we mentioned before, the way we calculate atomic mass is by taking the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Uh, and as a result of that, because neutrons and protons are whole things, we're always going to get a whole number answer for this type of a calculation. Taking a look over here at the element boron, we can clearly see that this is not a whole number answer. What this suggests to us, if we assume that this is an atomic mass, is that somewhere there is 0 0.811 of a proton or a neutron. And unfortunately for us, this is impossible. When you break things like protons and neutrons up into smaller pieces, they do not become fractions of protons or neutrons. They become entirely new particles. So we can't have 0.881. So I think really what we've done here is just come up with some justification why this can't possibly be an atomic mass. Our next goal then is to talk about what an atomic weight is and how it's different than this term from over here. In short, there must be something else going on that gets us that fraction of a proton or a neutron that we have not yet accounted for. And the answer to that question is the concept of an isotope. So let's come up with a quick definition of what an isotope actually is. Isotopes are a group of atoms with the same atomic number. So we have the same atomic number, which means that they are the same elements. But they have different numbers of neutrons. Changing the number of neutrons does not affect what element you're dealing with. What it does affect is the atomic mass of your substance. So now we're going to get a group of elements that are all, or a group of atoms that are all the same element, but they're going to have different masses. These masses need to be accounted for in the overall mass that we report on the periodic table. And that's going to be kind of a little bit of a hint, a little preview as to what we're going to be getting into. Now let's talk about an example of a group of isotopes. And some of the most commonly used isotopes are going to be the isotopes for the element hydrogen. Over on the left here, we can see that we have the nuclear symbols for our three isotopes of hydrogen. And over here, we talk about the naming system that we use for these. Uh, because these are all hydrogens, the name hydrogen is used for each, but we need to distinguish between the three of these. And the way we distinguish between the three of these is with this part of the name here. What this number shows us is the mass of the individual isotope. So this isotope here, hydrogen, has a mass of 1, so we call this guy hydrogen 1. 
This guy has a mass of two, so we call him hydrogen two. And this last isotope has a mass of three, so we call him hydrogen three. Normally, this is as far as we go with the naming system. However, hydrogen is a little bit special. These isotopes are used individually, which is not something we commonly do. And because they're used so commonly individually, they actually have their own names. We have hydrogen here. Deuterium is what we call hydrogen two. And tritium is what we call hydrogen three. And you can see the do being the Latin prefix for two and the tri being the Latin prefix for three. Uh, each one of these has their own particular application. And that's something we can talk about in class if you're curious. So let's recap what we've talked about so far. We've identified atomic mass, and we've kind of refined the definition of atomic mass a little bit. Atomic mass is now the actual mass of a particular isotope. It represents one atom, and it's always going to be a whole number answer. So that's what we're talking about with atomic mass. Our new term, then, is going to be atomic weight. Since we have multiple isotopes we're going to deal with, atomic weight actually represents an average mass of all those individual isotopes. And this value is very important for us because we want this average mass to represent real substances. And those real substances contain a natural blend of all the stable isotopes that exist. So we want our mass to represent all of those isotopes simultaneously. Hence, we're going to use an average. So good news, right? We all know how to calculate an average. We're going to use the simple equation A plus B plus C, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, divided by however many terms it is that we have. If you think back to our discussion before with the isotopes for hydrogen, there were three of them. They had a mass of one, two, and three respectively. And average means we're going to divide it by the number of things, so we'll divide this by three. And when you're done, you're going to get an average atomic mass of two atomic mass units. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. To check your work, the periodic table should show us the average atomic masses of all the individual elements. Let's check the average atomic mass of the element hydrogen. Now, unfortunately, we have an average atomic mass over here of 1.00794 and an average atomic mass over here of two atomic mass units. And these guys are not the same thing. They might seem like they're relatively close, uh, but in actuality, when you're talking about numbers one and two, being off by a whole digit is a pretty big deal. So again, we're kind of faced with another situation where something's going on here to calculate this average that we haven't accounted for over here. Now, just to be specific, this is a specific type of average known as a straight average. And a straight average, clearly we've now shown, is not the right way to approach this. So we have to look into this topic a little bit deeper to figure out what else is going on here. What we haven't considered in this process is the fact that not all isotopes occur at the same rate. We have more of one of them and less of the other. And we can keep track of that information with something known as percent abundance. And what percent abundance is, is the naturally occurring rate of each isotope represented as a percentage. Another way of saying that, this might be a little clearer to think down here, is how likely we are to find a particular isotope amongst a large group of atoms. So if we had a million atoms of a particular type, how many of that million would be one particular isotope and how many of that million would be another? This all boils down to the concept of stability. Some isotopes are more stable than others, and as a result of being more stable, they occur more naturally. We get more of those. The less stable ones occur less frequently. So let's go back then to our data from hydrogen and see if we can fold this percent abundance information back into what we've talked about from before. Here again is our data for hydrogen, the three known isotopes. And again, we can see, now we'll add in this idea of our percent abundances. It seems like most of the hydrogen out there is hydrogen one or just plain old hydrogen. 99.999%. This is the, by far the most abundant isotope. Deuterium is the next most abundant. It happens 0.001% of the time. And then tritium happens so infrequently, uh, we can describe it simply as being trace. It's a number that's really too small uh, for us to measure very, very accurately. So we start to see now that we got an average of two but in actuality, the real average on the periodic table represents one. Well, that has something to do with the fact that most of the hydrogen out there has hydrogen mass one. And as a result, our average got pulled towards the mass that occurred most abundant, and it got pulled away from the mass that was less common, as well as the tritium. 
So let's see if we can't quantify this a little bit and put some mathematics to this concept. So average atomic mass then is not what we would describe as a straight average, but rather it's something we would call a weighted average. It's weighted so that the impact of each isotope is affected by how common it naturally occurs. And we can go so farther to say the more percent abundant that actual isotope is, the bigger the impact, so the heavier the impact it is going to have on the average. We saw that before with the hydrogen. The average got pulled towards the one weight because that was the most naturally occurring. Now unfortunately for us, what this means is we're going to need a significant amount of data to do these kinds of problems. And that's not the kind of data I expect you to remember. It's simply the data I expect you guys to be able to look up. So to get that data, we're going to need a table, and the table of stable isotopes is the one that we're looking for. This data table provides us with two important pieces of information. First of all, it tells us what isotopes naturally occur. An element has a limited number of isotopes that occur naturally, and then other masses and other uh, numbers of neutrons uh, is something that's just not stable enough to exist. You can see over here on the table, some of these boxes are filled with information, and then many of them are left empty. The boxes with information represent isotopes that exist for a particular element. The boxes that are empty represent isotopes that don't exist. So we basically end up with a list of what isotopes are present for each element. This table also tells us the percent abundance of each isotope. And that's the information that's going to be located in each of the individual little boxes. So those boxes that are full have percent abundance data in them. Before we move on, this is a table you're definitely going to need to have on your own, uh, and you're going to need to download this. Uh, you can find it on the bottom of the page that this video is posted on, or you can also find it in your download section. It might not be a bad idea right now to pause the video, find the download, either get it up on the screen, or print it out so that you have this handy to look at. Here's a close-up view of that table. Hopefully you already have a copy of it. Uh, and here's how this whole thing works. On the left side, the vertical column, we can see we have the elements listed there. That letter Z is often used to represent atomic number, and that's exactly what you're going to see down that left column is the atomic number of each element. Across the table, you're going to see uh, the numbers 1 through 13. It's going to continue on as the rest of the table goes. These are your atomic masses or your mass numbers for each individual element. In the actual boxes themselves, these are the percent abundances. So we can clearly see for hydrogen, there are two known isotopes that are shown on this table, hydrogen 1 and hydrogen 2. We talked before about how that hydrogen 3 isotope does exist, but it's so uncommon we usually can't put a number to it. It seems like 100% of the isotopes are hydrogen 1 and 0.015% of them are hydrogen 2. I know what you're thinking. Those don't add up to 100, which is what percentages should do. But you've got to keep in mind the size of these tiny little boxes rounding needs to occur so that numbers can fit in and every so often you get a situation like this where our number gets rounded to 100. It's a little bit impractical and as you'll find when we do the calculations later our answers are going to be a little bit off from the answers that we'll actually expect from the periodic table and this is one of the good explanations as to why. Finally, to bring all this stuff together, we need a weighted average equation. We talked before about how a straight average equation wouldn't work, so now we've got a weighted one. And this weighted average equation has been custom tailored to match what we're actually talking about here. Now this looks very complicated, but in actuality it's relatively straightforward. These M terms, we have M1, M2, M3, etc., etc., these represent the atomic masses of your isotopes. So each isotope has its own atomic mass. Again, we can find that from our uh, stable isotopes data from before. The percent abundances, these guys right here, percent A, these represent the percent abundances of each isotope. Again, this can be found on your table. This is the information found in the individual box. The atomic masses are the f information found at the top of the actual uh, column each one of those masses, uh, percent abundances is recorded in. You'll notice, too, that there is a term for each isotope. So if your element has two isotopes, you're going to go over to here. If you have three isotopes, you're going to go over to here. And you're going to continue this process over and over and over again until you get to whatever that last isotope ends up being. Since every element has a different number of isotopes, we don't know how many that's going to be, so we use the number n here just to represent that there's going to be some number of isotopes eventually. 
Now, since we're using percentages instead of individual masses, instead of dividing by the total number, we're going to be dividing by the number 100. Your job really is going to be to take this and plug in the individual numbers from the data table. And we can talk about an example of that right now. Cool. Uh, here again, we have a zoomed in version of our table. This is going to provide us with the data that we're looking for. Uh, and we can see here we're going to be focusing on the element hydrogen. We're going to recalculate that average from before to see if we can't get uh, a number closer to what was reported on the periodic table. If you remember the equation from the previous slide, it's always the mass times the percent abundance. And again, the mass is going to be on the top of the column and the percent abundance is going to be in the box for the element. And then we're going to have again the mass of the next isotope times its percent abundance here in the box. We're not going to include information for this isotope or this isotope or any others because the empty box tells us that that, that isotope doesn't naturally occur. We're going to only focus on the ones that naturally occur. So let's see if we can put this into the formula and get a number. So we'll start again with the mass of the first isotope, which we said was 1. And we're going to multiply that by the percent abundance from the box, which we said was 100. We're going to add that then to the next isotope. We said its mass was 2, and its percent abundance was 0 0.015. We'll take that entire thing. We're going to divide that by 100, and once you get to this information, it's time to take a swing with your calculator. When you plug all this information in, you're going to get an answer that is 1.0003 atomic mass units. We again can compare this back to our periodic table, and we see that the number again was 1.00794. This isn't perfect, so we're comparing these two guys here. Again, it's not perfect. These numbers are similar, uh, but they're a little bit off. Explanation for that is two things. One we talked about before, our percent abundances on our table are rounded. Not because of any good scientific reason, but simply to make sure that they squeeze into these tiny itty bitty little boxes. So because those are rounded, we get numbers that are off a little bit. The second reason, which we're not going to have a lot of time to get into, is the fact that atomic mass is not actually the same thing as mass number. And we've been using those terms interchangeably. In our problems, we've actually been using mass number to calculate our averages, when in actuality we should be using atomic masses. And atomic masses are slightly different than the mass number. This is the distinction I don't think we need to make in this class, but I at least want to get it in your head that there is a subtle difference here. And one of the second reasons why these numbers don't match is simply because we're not using quite the right data. That's pretty much it. Um, you can practice this process with any element on the periodic table. Simply choose an element from the list, do the equation, plug all the numbers in, and you can always check your work by comparing your answer back to the average atomic weight reported on the periodic table.